What's up, everyone? Um, welcome to another episode of Writing Friction. Today, I got a pretty, pretty cool guest. Um, his name is Kevin, and he is the co-owner of my favorite bookstore, Green Apple Books. What's up, Kevin? How you doing? Not too bad, man. How are you doing? Thanks for coming on. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, most definitely. Um, so for people who don't know, uh, Green Apple Books is one of, you know, my again, my favorite bookstore in the country. Um, and they have two locations in San Francisco, one in the inner Richmond neighborhood and the other one in the inner sunset neighborhood. Um, the inner sunset one is called Books on the Park. Um, and you guys also just took over browser books right on Fillmore Street. That's a fact. We didn't we didn't uh, slap it with the Green Apple name, but uh, uh, keen eyed shoppers will uh, will notice some uh, some changes that are very Green Apple-y uh, in the store. How did that kind of all go about? How did that happen? Well, it's kind of a funny story. I mean, not not it's also a tragic story. Uh, we were meeting with this fellow. When I say me, I mean my partner Pete and I. Okay. Uh, he was he was trying to develop an app to kind of compete, be like to to sim- to really simplify the book buying process through an app, kind of one pu- one one button buying where you register at a bookstore and every time you see a book that you want, you just touch that on the app and everything happens automatically. Wow. So he was. He was doing, yeah. It would have been would have been awesome if he could have pulled it off. <laughs> he was doing some uh, research with us, meeting with us, and he grew up at Browser Bookstore. And during one of the talks, he just casually mentioned that he and his father were planning on buying the bookstore. Oh wow! Uh, because the owner, the founder, was terminally ill okay. and was looking to unload it. And he he mentioned that he and his father didn't really want to buy the bookstore, but they wanted to save it. Oh, re- oh okay. So, so that's how it happened. Yeah, and so Pete and I were kind of like, well, well, wait now, um, you know, if you're looking for a partner, maybe we could go in on that with you. Mm-hmm. And uh, and he said, no, actually, if you want to buy it, just you do it. We <laughs> don't really know how to run a bookstore. Yeah. So that's how it came about. That's crazy. I mean, I moved to San Francisco um, a little over nine years ago, and the first bookstore I ever walked into was Browser Books. Um, I actually, um, yeah, what I, I, I'm actually looking at the book. I bought the book Songwriters on Songwriting by Paul Zillow. Um, it's like okay. a, it's like a collection of inter- you know, he interviews Bob Dylan, Joan Baez, you know, all those people um, about how they you That's know great write that you songs. Remember that. Yeah, I mean, at this point, I. I I can look at every book on my bookshelf, tell you where I bought it, what yeah. year, you know what I mean? It's like, again, and you owning one of my favorite bookstores, it's like you live around books. And I'm always talking about how important books are, just, you know, just the vibe of books, even as an art form, um, you know, having books on your shelves. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, you live in one of my dreams. You get to be surrounded by books all day. <laughs> yeah. Um, so is that one of, I mean, you know, I got a couple of questions, but is that one of kind of the cool things about being part of owning a bookstore? Um, well, you, know. you know, like any job, it's one of those things that becomes a job. Most definitely. So I'm sure that if you are, uh, you know, uh, uh, a high fashion photographer or something, <laughs> you know, it's just a job. Yeah. You know, at first, you, you know, at first you're kind of starstruck or something, but then it's just, you know, it's another day at the office. And, um. And I do actually sometimes have to remind myself that 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 it's more than just a job. That that it, you know, not it, that it's actually kind of a sacred trust to to take care of this this store and to make sure it stays healthy and continues on for the next generation. You know, and, and sometimes you get a little frustrated and you're ready to throw in the towel mm-hmm. and you're like, well, I can't I can't do that. You know, because mm-hmm. it's green apple and and uh, and so yeah, I do have to remind myself sometimes that that I'm very lucky to you know, to own Green Apple. How, how long have you been Green Apple every day? Yeah. How long have you been involved with the store just in general? Per, I, per, I started working there in 1987. The year I was born. <laughs> the year you were born. Yeah. Um, I started working there part time. I worked there for about three years. Uh-huh. Um, met the woman who would become my wife. And, so everyone's uh, love story. True. <laughs> yeah. Actually, actually we probably have a half dozen marriages and, Several children that have come out of uh, come out of the store. No way. Oh, absolutely. Oh, that's yeah. unbelievable. Um, and then I, I left for a few years because we thought we shouldn't work together. And then I came back as the general manager of the store at a time when the owner, the founding owner, was looking to pass it on. Okay. And so he 
he kind of put together two other employees and myself and structured this deal where we could buy it basically with sweat equity um, without having to go to the bank because we were all just three poor booksellers. Most definitely. But, yeah, but he, he basically structured it so that, you know, we just paid him over 10 years and, and, uh, and at the end of that, we own the store and so it worked out great for him. It worked out great for us. Yeah, no, it, that, that's a beautiful story. You said um, book buying. Were you working at some point as a book buyer at Green Apple Books? Yeah, I've, I've pretty much done everything. I started mm-hmm. off, I was the remainder buyer, and then I was the general manager, and then I was the buyer. You know, you you mentioned in your email that you talked to Frank when yeah. you got your own book into the mm-hmm. store. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and then Frank took over. Frank was Frank is kind of a legendary buyer. He's, he's worked at a couple other big stores in the Bay Area. Okay. He's been, he's been longer than I have, and oh. uh, he, he's pretty well-known, you know. Well, I was going to say, when I came trying to set, so I, so the reason Green Apple holds, a, you know, holds dear to my heart is you guys were the one bookstore who really kind of, you know, rallied around my book when I released it three weeks before the world ended. <laughs> uh, but that I, being, I'm sorry? I actually have a story about that. Okay, I'm, let, 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 please share. I, I don't know. I don't know. You was never met. I didn't. Um, I never heard of your book. But after we closed down for the pandemic, I was the only employee going into the store trying okay. to fill online orders and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And we kept getting orders for your book. Huh. And I'm like, and I'm like, what is this kid <laughs> thing? And and I kept filling orders, and then we ran out. And we had to get more in, and and so I really noticed it because I I, I had no idea how it got into the store. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that's a that funny story. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's definitely true though because I remember it very specifically. Like, wow, they were getting a lot of orders for this. Book. That's I dope. What the story is. Yeah, no, I mean, so well, so you mentioned Frank, and really, my thing was um, when I went in to sell that book to Green Apple, I Frank just happened to be working that day. Um, I had never met Frank before, um, so I kind of just nervously walked up to him. Long story short, my, you know, I wrote a boxing book. Frank is, I guess, a huge boxing fan. So him and I ended up talking for like 20 minutes about like boxing and UFC. Um, but then what happened when I was leaving the store, and I think this kind of maybe cemented his, you know, appreciation for me as, a, you know, maybe a writer. You guys on the other – so, pe- again, for people who don't know, Green Apple Books is split into t- the main plays, the main branch, is split into two sections. You have the you know, the new side and essentially the you side, right? I mean, that's kind of one way to put no, it. No, actually, the main, the main store and then the annex is um, annex. Fiction, fiction and music. But we have new and used in both stores. Okay, no, thanks for the yeah. correction. So I was yeah. in the annex, and in the annex, you guys – I don't know if you – I think you still have it, but you had um, – the, you know, the best book of the year for the last, you know, 30, 40 years or something like that. Do you know what I'm talking about? Right. One, because we just, we, when we had our 50th anniversary recently, mm-hmm. we put this display together of the yeah. best book from each of our 50 years. Exactly. And we've kept that going. Now we've got it at the best book from each of our 53 years. Okay, cool. So, yeah. so the reason Frank and I hit it off was because I think, and I'm going to get the year wrong, I think it was 19... Oh, 76 you guys huh? had you had the sports writer by richard oh, Ford. The sports writer okay. yeah which i thought was an interesting choice because you know when people think of him they think of independence day which he won the pulitzer prize for um the sports writer was his first book and a book that i actually enjoyed more um and then frank and i just i kind of mentioned that to frank and he kind of you know, got a little smile on his face um and we kind of you know hit it off that way uh, but yeah. i thought that was a great display you guys have yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. No, it's kind of just a great way to kind of just, you know, again, a lot, I feel, you know, you correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I read, a, spend a lot of my time reading books, um, but, you know, for the for the average person walking into a bookstore, do you think they know what it is they want to buy when they walk in? Or do you think a lot of it is just simply we're browsing through if something kind of catches our eye? You know, in your experience, what is it like more? Well, I, I don't know what percentage of them of customers come in looking for a specific book versus mm-hmm. open to something but actually when i'm training like my employees on how to how to merchandise a section i always tell them there's two kinds of customers <laughs> there's one who knows what they're looking for and in that case all you have to do is make sure your section is alphabetized yeah. and logical yeah. and then there's the one who doesn't know what they're looking for mm-hmm. and that's the one you can you know have your books faced out like unusual, interesting, out of the, you know, out of the ordinary books. 
uh, faced out with shelf talkers. And that's like, I always say, that's where you're, that's where the fun is. Like, yeah. like the person who knows what they're looking for, it's pretty easy to get that for them if you have it. But it's mm-hmm. the people who, who don't know what they're open, looking for, who are open to, you know, chance. Yeah. That's the ones you can like, that's the ones who you can actually put a book into their hand that you you love. And so as a bookstore owner and as a previous book buyer, do you know when you're, you know, again, I'm just speaking from someone who doesn't really know the kind of back workings of it all. You know, when a book comes out that the publisher is pushing hard, you know, like it's going to be on the front shelf of every single bookstore in the nation. Um, how does Green Apple work with those publishers? Do publishers kind of contact you directly? Do you deal with literary agents? How do these big books kind of come about and get onto your shelves? Well, we, the, the, every you know because we're a, a, a major bookstore, yeah. we see sales reps from every publisher for mm-hmm. the most. Um, and they come in, and you know they, they don't come in anymore, but they used to come in, <laughs> and uh, and and we, you know they send us promotional material, and and they'll present us you know all the all the information they think we need, mm-hmm. and so it's kind of you know when the, it's like any any buyer you know sales rep relationship yeah. where where there are going to be things that they really think you should get. And there's some of them you're going to say, you know what? I don't think I can sell that. Mm-hmm. And some of them, some of those, they'll say, no, I think you should take it. And you'll, based on your relationship, you'll say, yeah, yeah okay, I'll take it based on our previous history. Um, so you'll they, hold trust they, with these individual sellers, uh, these individual you know, reps? We have, a, we have with long relationships with all of them. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, you know, you just, they know that they know what the store can sell. They're not interested in, in loading us up with a bunch of books that we can't sell. They know there's different markets for every book and that's something that might sell really well, you know, nationally, um, isn't necessarily going to sell in, in the Richmond district. Uh huh. Um, <laughs> but, uh, then there's also things that maybe don't have a chance to sell nationally at all. Like this little book fight kid. That, yeah. Tell uh, me about it. That, uh, that, uh, you know, local guy wrote it and, uh, and, uh, you know, we think it's a green apple kind of book and, you know, so the rep, that's the kind of thing the rep will know. Cause we had no idea who the author of that book was. Most right? definitely. So if a rep was coming in to sell it, he would be the person or they would be the person to tell us, you know, to give us that extra information. Like, Oh, this is a local author, got a lot of local connections, does a podcast. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we think you're going to sell this book. Very cool. So uh, let me, let me use a for instance. So, a, a book I loved, a book that you couldn't really escape in the year 2018, 2019, and a local author, um, They're There by Tommy Orange, right? That's a yeah. book, great book. Obviously, it's written, it's based in Oakland, California. He's a local yeah. guy. Um, does a book like that, do the publisher, does the rep kind of come with you with that specific book, knowing it's a Bay Area thing? I mean, are you pushing that, that book extra hard? I mean, it's a great case, book. In that case, the publisher had it pegged as a major title exactly had, you know they, they they came to us with a large with a large print run a large promotional budget mm-hmm. and said you you know you need to take a position on this book mm-hmm. and um and they you know we didn't push back on that one at all of course you know, it was like it just you know and then they you know they send out early galleys in case somebody reads it or whatever i don't know if anybody at our store read it before it was published but um uh it, it just had a lot going for it. Yeah, no, know? most definitely. Yeah, um, so so that was an easy one. Yeah, the more... But I'll tell you one I remember please. when I was a buyer. I remember uh, sitting down with my Simon & Schuster rep, and <laughs> she had this book with this weird title. And I think she remembers it differently because she says she pushed me on it. Okay. I don't remember her pushing me on it, but I love the title so much that I thought, okay, I'll take five. And that book was a heartbreaking work of staggering. <laughs> and, and I bought it specifically. I had no idea who the author was. Yeah. I, I, I knew uh, my, my partner, not partner then, he was just a, my coworker then, Pete, was a big McSweeney's reader. So he, I think he told me, oh yeah, that guy does McSweeney's. I, I like McSweeney's. Mm. But, um, but uh, I just liked the title so much that I bought like five. Crazy. And then they sold out in like two minutes. Unbelievable. And, uh, yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, when I, the more and more I have these conversations about, you know, liter- with literary agents and bookstore owners, the book world is very similar to the music world. 
right? These, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seems to be, you know, these major publishers almost act as like major record labels, right? There's going to be books and artists specifically that they're going to push. Like you said, they're there, right? The promotion, this is a major promotion. We're going to push this book hard. Um, you know, like in the heyday of the music business, you know, when Britney Spears released a new record, you know, Jive Records, whoever had her was pushing their money forward for, you know, it's, it, and it's almost like one artist makes up the deficit for the 50 artists, other artists who don't sell anything. Um, well, yeah. That, that's kind of an, an old truism of the publishing industry that I think yeah. like old timers would say isn't true anymore. But okay. that old like old old time houses like FSG or something, they would have these tent pole authors who would sell, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of copies, which would allow them to publish Yeah, the tent pole author thing, that's an interesting concept. I mean you're literally talking about an author acting as a literal tent pole. <laughs> Right, holding yeah, up I a mean, tent. I think that's a movie term, isn't it? But um, I don't know. Actually, that, that makes sense. Yeah, uh, kind of like a Tom yeah. Cruise or something like that. Yeah, right. Uh, like, yeah, you got to have that one big name, and then you can bring everybody else in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so going back to running a bookstore, book buying. I, you know, you're talking to these major publishers, these reps, and things like that. Does Green Apple, or in your experience working in the bookstore, are there other bookstores that you you know, not idolize, but appreciate how they do their business. Do they do similar business or all bookstores kind of similar in that way? You know, I would say not actually, Uh, you know, one of the problems, you know, with, with, we have a national organization, the American booksellers association, Mm -hmm. and they, you know, they work on all these initiatives to, you know, and they're very good. They're a great trade organization. You know, if they, uh, if the independent, record store uh, group had had a trade organization as good as ours, there might be more record stores around. I mean, you guys are uh, the new record store. <laughs> yeah. You but, know? you know, we just, we have a great trade organization that really focuses on educating its membership and, and you know, making sure they have good business practices and, you know, that, you know, our whole website is, back end is due to the trade organization. We didn't build that ourselves. We couldn't have afforded that. You, um, when someone's buying a book on your website, you mean? Yeah, the whole the whole you know website is you know we're we're selling the book. Yeah, but but it's the American Booksellers Association. We subscribe to them and, and to their service, and they 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 built the whole infrastructure for our website, and we just put our template into it. Amazing. Okay, and, and that's it, true with most independent bookstores. So Very the, few have built their own website. So then that leads me to another question: How familiar familiar? are you with bookstores outside of the country? Do they operate the same kind of way? I mean, you know, when, when a book, and let, let's just, I guess, stick with they're there. You know, when they're there is getting sold in the UK, um, are the reps running the same kind of spiel? Are they kind of doing the same thing or is it run differently outside of the country? You know, I assume it's probably fairly similar. Mm-hmm. The, the only thing I know about uh, uh book selling outside of the United States is um, one time I had a, you know, a publisher dinner. One of the nice things about the end of the book business is it's a very cordial business. Oh, and most definitely. Have, you know, we get together, <laughs> we have meals and stuff. And, and I actually, we had a lunch with the, the Hachette, the American publisher Hachette is actually owned by a French company. Okay. And we had a lunch with the French CEO of the company. Okay. Uh, and he explained to me, and I think this is still true, that in French, because, you know, the French are very protective of their culture, mm-hmm. um, unlike in the United States. <laughs> they, fund, they fund the arts and all this, and bookstores in France are not allowed to discount books more than, like, 5% or something like that. Hmm. And so he said what that has led to is in France – a country probably about the size of California. Yeah. He says they, they service 10,000 different accounts um, in France. And that's because you can't undersell somebody. So, yeah. so you can't, you, you would never shop by price. You'd only shop by, by aesthetic. Huh. And so if you wanted to open a bookshop that like, if you were a, MMA fan, I'm going to keep going back to fight you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you wanted to open up a little tiny kiosk bookshop that just focused on 
martial arts and and boxing and you carried like 400 titles you could cut you could do that because nobody's selling those books for less than you are so there's no reason for anybody to shop somewhere else besides your little tiny shop uh-huh. and so what it creates this diversity of of voices i, I just think it's brilliant mm-hmm. you know it's not brilliant for the consumer because they don't get to pay as little as possible mm-hmm. but you know as we've all learned from amazon and from everything going on in the economy now it's like this race to the paying as little as possible for everything isn't necessarily good for everybody no i mean for you probably don't know so uh, outside of writing books um i pay my rents but i own a dog walking business um uh-huh. and i'm seeing it in my business um people yeah, are trying to undercut it, undercut it's franchising right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. absolutely and, yeah. Um, yeah and uh, as a business you know as a fellow business owner my whole mantra is just as long as i do the the job well i am right. worth the money being paid um you know it, it's when you start cutting corners and things like that and you know and well, we don't have to get into it but yeah it's um yeah yeah owning a business it's, is very interesting funny, it's, it's a weird it's a weird parallel but it's exactly the same you're mm-hmm. an independent you're an independent business person providing a service yep. trying to provide a high level of service yep. and you're being undercut by somebody who's paying as little as possible yep. to people, you know, desperate for the paycheck. Yep. And and yeah, no, that's just, that's happening everywhere. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> oh man. Um. All right, let's keep it book focused. Um. I've always wanted to know. So, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was the ice tinkling in my glass. <laughs> oh, okay. Think. Yeah, Kevin is enjoying a nice beverage. I am not. I just got home from work actually. Um. So, when I did Fight Kid, um. I had a dream of, you know, one day doing, you know, a book signing or something like that. You have any memorable or favorite book signings or book readings from Green Apple specifically that you were attending? Well, book signings. Hmm. I mean, because you guys have some pretty heavy hitters come through there. We certainly have. Yeah. We certainly have. Um, when I first started there back in 87, I think we did Amy Tan's very first signing. Oh, wow. Although... I, I have since asked her about that, and she seemed non-committal, so I'm not <laughs> sure. But, but I remember we did this signing for the Joy Luck Club with like we had like 500 copies, and um, but I don't know. Maybe she had done an event before that. Uh-huh. But um, let's see, signings. You had Ali mm-hmm. Wong in recently, right? Didn't she do a big signing for you? She didn't. She didn't do. She'd want to do it publicly. Oh, but okay. We actually, we um we actually had a nice little thing going with her where uh, she would. She, she came in, um, she actually came in when we first bought Browser, we were, we did a little meet the owner's day Okay. and she came into the store and oh, I wow. said, Hey, you're Ali Wong. <laughs> <laughs> and this is when we'd first taken over the store and they had ordered one copy of the book and it had already sold. That's so funny. Yeah. So but like she was nice enough to say, well, here, you know, here, contact me when you get more. Okay. So we, we ordered a bunch. She came into Green Apple and signed. They sold out immediately, and then we ordered like five hundred more, mm-hmm. <laughs> and she and she came in and signed them. Yeah, so, I remember, yeah, I saw it on, on your Instagram page. Yeah, um, yeah, she was super nice. That's about cool. It. Yeah, um, yeah. Have you added some like local authors? I know, like, or I think did Oro Kwan do a signing of her book at your store? She's, you know, she's been so great. She, she. Um, uh, has been such a big like booster of our books on the park store. She, yes. She, yeah. She's a, she's done readings there. She's done interviews with other authors there. She's she's been great along yeah. with Esme Wang. Like the books on the park store is where we when we opened that store six seven years ago now we we built it specifically um, to do events. So we don't really do a lot of events at the at the um, Clement Street store. Okay. Small. We'll do small like local authors or something, but bigger ones, we definitely all do those, do all of those at the uh, books on the park store. Yeah. You have, the li- this- you have the little more keen side, right? We are. What's that? Do you have like the little more keen side or am I thinking of something else? So you have like, that shows the author's name when you guys are doing signings. At oh the- yeah, yeah. 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 We have the outside yeah. and we built it like with this, with this kind of state stepped seating in the kids section mm-hmm. and with tables that are on wheels. So we can fit, 
we, we, we fit like 150 people in there. We had John Waters in there. There, yeah. Um, um fu- and, actually, uh, I, funny, funny story. Um, I, what was the name of the, his last book? Um, oh, man. I, the, the Hitchhiking Book? No, nah, John, John Waters is like, unless I'm thinking of someone else, like the Handlebar Mustache. No, it's uh, not a handlebar. It's a little pencil. Yes, yes. yes. So I, so I actually funny, or even I sold his book. <laughs> um, every year I used to do a gig. I used to sell merchandise at Great American Music Hall and Slims. Um, and every year at Great American Music Hall, he does like a Christmas thing. And the year, oh, okay. yeah, and the year I was working, I was selling his. He must have sold. He sold probably 250, 300 books that night. Oh sure, yeah, yeah. yeah, he's, yeah. He's, I, I love him so much. He's a character. He's so, he's so <laughs> down to earth yeah. and just like real. He's just, he's just, he's the nicest guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's come into the store and signed a couple times, and That's he's cool. just, he's got zero bullshit in him. He's yeah, great. no, for sure. Well, yeah. another zero bullshit guy. Um, I just talked to Danny Bland. Um, and he was, I mean, he was an absolute trip. You guys, you know, have been super supportive of him. Um, and it's just like, you know, just, you have to realize like, you know, speaking as, you know, uh, as a reader first, like your store will always act as a hub. Like I've met, you know, you're talking about people meeting for marriages. You know, I've met numerous friends just browsing at that bookstore. Um, yeah, bookstores are always going to be the kind of place that you should feel comfortable in talking to a stranger. You know, yeah, um, yeah. It, it, picking up a book, you know, oh, why did you pick up that book? You know, oh, wh- what are you reading? Things like that. It sh- I feel like it should always be a conductor to informal conversation, um, even of with the course. people who work there. Yeah, yeah. When I when I was a younger bookseller, I, I went to like this educational uh, seminar and there were booksellers from around the country and there were some booksellers from the tattered cover there. Mm-hmm. And somehow it came up, they mentioned that they had a store policy that at the register you were not allowed to like make any acknowledgement of what the customer was buying. Interesting. Um, huh. huh. Which, you know, because it, it's a big store. It probably had 250, 300 employees at the time and you get that big, you can't control it. Of it course. becomes corporate. And book buying is fraught. You know, people can expose themselves by buying <laughs> books about on very personal subjects. So obviously they said they must have had some interactions go wrong. Yeah. And so they just brought the hammer down and said, okay, this is the rule. But I, I remember thinking like, that is so sad because yeah. like, that's like the best part of being in the store. It's like somebody comes up with, with a book by Richard Powers and you say, oh, well, have you read this? And it's oh, like, oh, no, God. I haven't read that. And then you're like, you're off and you've recommended three other books. And that's, that's the whole point of going into a store. He actually might be coming on the podcast. Um, Get out of here, I, yeah, really? I talked to him. So he, so I'm a huge fan of his, and I, I love the Orver story. Um, oh yeah, yeah. And you know, I, I prepped. You know, I, I prepped for this uh, podcast because yeah. I thought you'd ask me what I'm reading, and, well, well, so and I, I had to, I had to kind of look at my bookshelf <laughs> and see what I'd read recently, and I. That's that was my pandemic reading book, and it was I, it was just fucking great. Oh, he's the fucking man. So well, cool yeah. because I emailed him, and he got back to me like four days later. Um, and we're gonna try to. He he literally lives on a mountain in like southern Appalachia. Um, I mean, okay. yeah, he is. You know, he is a a heady guy. Um, but he was. But yeah, su- yeah, he is. yeah, yeah, but super super responsive, and yeah, we're gonna try to make it happen. I mean, that would be a dream. Oh, good. Come, yeah, that would be a dream come true. Um. I also read, uh, I loved Orfeo. Um, you know, I mean, he is. That was, well, Overstory was the first book of his that I'd read, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, and no, Orfeo is fantastic. Um, yeah. Because, yeah, Overstory won the Pulitzer. Did he, win an, did he win a National Book Award for, for anything or no? I, I, you know, to be honest, I don't know. I feel okay. like the Overstory won everything. It did, um, yeah. It was I one mean, of those books. Uh, we're yeah, talking. I was kind of a little, I'd had it on my nightstand for a long time. I was a little intimidated by Very. it. And then like, okay, okay pandemic. Now I, <laughs> now I can do it. I can just read this book. And, well, I mean, it's a 500 yeah. page book about trees. <laughs> Literally. It, um, it, it, it's just amazing oh, the way he, he brings, like he starts off like every chapter with a new character. Mm-hmm. And you're like, is this, is the whole book going to be this way? Mm-hmm. And then slowly but surely mm-hmm. all those characters come together. It was just, it was really brilliant. He is yeah. a monster writer. Yeah. <laughs> monster writer. Yeah, it's so yeah. funny you brought that up. Um, yeah, yeah. when he got back to me, again, like, you know, 
these are all cold call emails. So w- when you email a Pulitzer Prize winning author, you don't really expect. And I emailed him directly. I didn't even go through his agent. Um, and he, yeah, he shot me an email back. So we'll see. Um, you know, who knows? Uh, what are you? Th- uh, what's up? You had run into Adam Johnson on oh, the street. And that's another story. Yeah. So are uh, are you an Adam Johnson fan? I mean, you know, he's an SF. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, you know, I, Actually, he, he hasn't had a book since Orphan Master's Son, has he? Uh, well, uh, was Fortune Smile? I think Fortune Smiles. Yeah, Fortune Smiles was after the Orphan Master's oh, Son. Yes, that's that one. Yeah, no, funny because I actually picked up <laughs> yeah. a, I picked up a signed copy of it from Green Apple. Um, yeah, he won the yeah. National Book Award for that. But no, I ran. He lives in my neighborhood, and uh-huh. I ran into him. I was dropping off dogs, and yeah. I saw him walking down the street, and I I was in my van, and I yelled at his name. And he yeah. turns around and he looked at me and he's like, who the fuck are you? Uh, and yeah. you know, he, yeah. he was wearing like a sweatshirt and like a backpack. Um, and I was like, you know, and the only reason I even knew it was him was because in the back of the hardcover Orphan Master's Son, or it might be Fortune uh, Smiles, he does an interview. And at the end of the interview, there's a little black and white photo of him, just his face. That's it. Okay. And off of that, I was able to recognize him. And the fact that I recognized him, I mean, he sat and talked to me for like 30 minutes. Yeah, um, he's, a, he's a really, really magnetic, oh, yeah. lovable guy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, so have, have, you actually had, have you had a chance to meet him and talk to he, him? He's come, he's, he brings his kids into the story. Awesome. Yeah, I haven't seen him in a while. Yeah. I, I, I think he's, since he won the Pulitzer, he, uh, he uh, um, you know, he's probably not in San Francisco as much as he is in San Francisco. Mm, yeah. Uh, well, he, he was telling, he teaches at Stanford, I think possibly. I'm not sure. As, I mean, he, he did. I, I assume he's still on, on, on the faculty there. Yeah. We, I got to tell you, we, um, we don't do them much anymore, but we used to do these videos for our, our book of the month. Uh-huh. And the orphan master's son was our book of the month. Uh-huh. And you should go on to YouTube and, Look at our watch our video for the Orphan Master's son. <laughs> I'll put a link. He, yeah, he appears in the end of it, and oh. uh, and it's very funny. Yeah, no, it, it's you know he's a very unassuming guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, and again, and the the look on his the look on his face when I called out his name, he was just like, "Who on earth would know who who are you?" <laughs> Authors are, are lucky because they can be celebrities and still be anonymous. For the most part, right? The other day, so I am, I'm tearing, I'm tr- I'm catching up. I'm tearing through his, every Cormac McCarthy book I possibly, every one. Um, I got two of them left. I just finished, um, this morning, I just finished The Road, actually. Um, he's only done one interview ever with Oprah. And Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And there's, oh, it's, there's one video and they edited it down to like five minutes. And he's, you know, he's an old, he's an older man at this point. Um, it's his first ever ever television appearance ever and it's interesting you can even see in his body language how uncomfortable he is he's right, kind of, yeah, he's right. kind of like cowering he's got his hand on his his head on his hand um and i'm you know you read his books and he i think arguably he's the greatest living author we have um and but you, again like you would never he would just be some old man walking down the street you would have no idea um, right. No. No sure. clue. Um, I'm not even sure I'd recognize him. Actually. Exactly. Yeah. It's exactly. Yeah. I'm, in fact, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't. I would just. Yeah. Because I've seen every. I bet every picture. I bet the last picture I saw of him was taken 25 years ago. <laughs> exactly. He probably had a mustache yeah. and a different wife. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's interesting though, and I've talked about this with some other people. How you know, as time goes on, and you know, especially with social media and you know, Instagram, and you know, a lot of authors are very active on social media. Um, what are your thoughts, if any, you know, on authors kind of now? Some of them, I, I won't say anyone specifically, but some authors kind of take up in a public image now, almost. Um, you know, the social image is almost as important as the books that they're writing at times. Do you ever see that, or you kind of come across that with some authors? Well, the only thing I can say about that is publishers are putting less into promoting books than they used to, Uh and there's fewer venues, and if you've spent two years writing a book, then you have earned the right to do anything you can to oh, try to yeah. promote that, you know? It's just, it, yeah. it's just crazy. I mean, yeah, I, I, could you imagine Philip Roth on Twitter? <laughs> you know, <laughs> if, if, if he was writing his first book now, 
he'd probably he'd have to do something because he, mm-hmm. unless unless his publisher, you know, Philip Roth was probably I don't know. He probably actually was a superstar right out of the gate. I don't I don't, I don't know his first what book. His first yeah, book? His, Goodbye Columbus. Yeah, he, it won the National uh, Book Award. Yeah, so he probably I don't know where he came from. Yeah. If he was like in a writing program or if he was writing short stories for the New Yorker, or how he, or if the book was just so good, his publisher yeah. just decided to promote a first author right from the start. Yeah. I, I have no idea about that, but um, he might be an exception as far because there are still authors who their first novel is huge. Well, let and, me uh, well let me ask you a question about that. Are there publishers who will push first-time authors hard? And if so, what goes behind that? I mean, are there certain accolades you need to have to have, certain, you know, MFA degrees? Did you have to go to Breadloaf? You know, like, what makes a first-time author get pushed real hard by a publisher? Yeah, well, there's probably a bunch of different um, ways that happens. If the book is just really good, like they're there, Mm -hmm. um, and the publisher really believes in it, yeah. then they'll put dollars behind it. Yeah. Which, you know, that helps. Yeah. But uh, maybe it's a, maybe it's not, maybe the publishers agreed to publish it, but they're not necessarily putting a huge budget behind it. Mm-hmm. And, but the, you know, the author has a lot of connections because he's been, like you said, going to these conferences, going mm-hmm. to staying at Bread Loaf and mm-hmm. whatnot. And, knows and it's going to get reviewed in all these all these journals and Mm -hmm. it's going to build that way Mm -hmm. you know there's i think there's a lot of different ways that the first time authors break through yeah Uh, sometimes it happens really slowly Mm -hmm. like uh or you know i I think maybe this is a bad example but i'm thinking of uh the where the crawdads thing oh yeah for sure uh, which which is was that jesmin ward no who was that that was uh i forget uh what is the author's name yeah I know the okay. book. Uh, yeah, I know, yeah. So, so that one, that's not a, the best example because I think that was picked by Reese Witherspoon as her book club book. And that but, helps. <laughs> but but it's an example of a book that came out, sold almost nothing. Uh-huh. I think we, you know, maybe the publisher liked it and we ordered five copies, put it on a table, sold two or three, yeah. and then put one in the section. Yeah. And then a couple months later, sold another one, then a couple months later, sold two. And then next thing you know, it's back on the table. And then next thing you know, it's like never coming out in paperback because it's selling so well. Unbelievable. And, and and that's that's a word of mouth thing. Yeah. Uh, that happens every once in a while. Um, that uh, you know, there's just you know, there's just a lot of different ways that that books get put into people's hands. Yeah, I mean, in today but, in, well, in today's world, I mean, I don't know if you listen or are familiar with Joe Rogan and his podcast, but I mean, if he mentions your book on the podcast. The next day, it sold out on Amazon. Um, sure. He, he had a guy, right. and I, it was a great book. I don't know if you read any nonfiction, um, and I couldn't get it because you guys were sold out of it. Um, it was called Empire of the Summer Moon, um, and it's about the Comanche Indians. Sure, um, right. Yeah, yeah, and, and it was by the author is S.C. Gwynn, and right. he, Rogan, me- the, the day he mentioned he was reading this book, that night, it sold out in every single copy possible. Um, yeah. and then, and then he brought the guy onto the podcast and he right. talks about, he was like, dude, he was like, I had no idea. I'm sitting at home and all of a sudden I get an email from like my agent saying, Hey, Joe Rogan just mentioned you and you sold out every single copy of your book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that's, that's one way it happens. Yeah. yeah. There's, you know, what we call influencers, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. People who, 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 um, who mentioned your name and yeah. everybody's got to know, obviously fresh air is huge. You know, if you're on fresh air and you, you're in the New York times book yeah. review, you're in the New Yorker. I mean, there's just, you know, but that's, you know, everybody's fighting for those few channels, I guess. Most definitely. Um, but it's, yeah. it's just, it's amazing how something can literally overnight just pop, you know? Um, yeah. And with books, it, it's different than music, right? Cause with a hit song, I mean, you know, within two minutes, three minutes if it's a hit, you know, within 10 seconds, um, you know, books you have to spend time with. Um, so to get the kind of recognition behind a book and to have that kind of, you know, overnight success really kind of talks about, you know, how, of course, yeah, yeah of how course. influenced somebody people to, really are. Somebody has to recommend it. I mean, yeah. for the part people, you know, I don't know what, like if you walk into green apple and you don't know what book you want mm-hmm. to read, and you're just kind of scanning the tables, 
you know, you're going to look at the shelf talkers, you're going to look at the cover, Mm -hmm. but what makes you just pick up this one book? Yeah. You know, it's, it's a mystery and uh, you know, it'll never be, it'll never be a science. It'll always be a metaphysical interaction. Yeah, And as a writer myself, you know, and I've talked about this with other writers, it's, you know, you spend two years writing your book, you know, if you're able to get it published through a big publishing house, you know, however long that process takes, and maybe you can shine some light on that, actually. But, um, and then great, now your book's on the shelf and some, you know, schmuck like me walks in, reads the first two sentences, and then I don't like it and I just put it down. You know, that's what we're dealing with, with books. Um, as a writer, you know, as an author, you have to capture people on the first sentence. Um, it's very fickle that way. Uh, it's, you know, again, unlike music, where with music, and you know, if you don't like a song, you know what you don't like a song, you just go to the next one. Um, with books, you know, as a book, as again, as a person who buys books also, uh, you know, I've walked into plenty of bookstores and I've picked up a copy of a book that someone had recommended. I read the first page. I'm like, I just don't really like this, you know? And you, yeah. and you can't even give it the chance because books take time. <laughs> yeah. You know, it takes yeah, time. Yeah, I gotta say, I've never, I've never read a book like that. I've, I've basically, uh, you know, for whatever the alchemy is that makes me decide I'm gonna give this book a try, mm-hmm. once I've made that decision, then I then I give it at least like 40 or 50 pages. I don't, I don't feel obligated to finish every book, but I, I would, um, I, you know, I guess also I'm not like a customer walking into a bookstore with no idea of what I'm looking for. Well, that's so. what I was talking about. I mean, yeah. if you're someone who you don't know and you, you know, you just like the yeah. cover of this book and you pick sure, it yeah. up that, right. that, you know, obviously if you're going in there for, you know, the overstory, you kind of know what you're getting into. Uh, right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, but again, and also with the, you know, with my first book, I had to learn all about you know cover illustration too. Um, you Absolutely. know, a, a lot yeah. of a lot of work goes behind these covers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of work. I mean, because that's what you know. Again, when you're walking into Green Apple, you know, these covers they, they got to catch your eye. Um, they do e- absolutely. Even the binding. I see so many self-published books with bad covers. Oh, it's gross. Like, oh, you should have asked somebody. Gross. You know, I know. Just, don't just do the Photoshop. Mm-hmm. Just you know, you wrote the book, you took mm-hmm. however long to write the book, and then you spent five minutes mm-hmm. on the cover. And, mm-hmm. Oh, that's not good. It's yeah. gross. You know, it's it's like it's like shopping for food when there's like plastic displays of the food in the window. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's just like it turns you off. Yeah. It, it, it turns you off. Um, well, man, I mean, we, we went we went longer than, you know, we planned. Um, we can keep going if you want, or we'd love to have you back on. Um, I know you're a busy guy. Uh, but... Yeah, I mean, totally up to you. We can get going if you want. Let's 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 give it five more minutes. How's yeah, that? sure. Yeah, no, most definitely. All right. Um, so I again, I, I kind of I'm kind of a little bit obsessed with the book buying aspect of bookstores. Um, you yeah. had said a little bit earlier about a bookstore. I forget the name, the one you named, but they 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 had instituted a policy where once you got to the counter, no dialogue can be exchanged about the purchase. Yeah, that was tattered cover. Okay. Yeah, just yeah, just. Yeah, they didn't want any. They didn't want any anybody putting their foot in their mouth. Yeah, yeah. Well, so what, what I was going to ask is, um, you you know, you said it's a, you know sometimes it's an emotional thing. Are book buyers buying the books that they want to read? <laughs> I mean, you know, what is what exactly is that job? Yeah. Um, no. You know. You know what it is is um, a good book buyer. Yeah for any particular store is is a conduit for the customers of that store. Yes. And so you you from time and experience know what kind of books your customers like. Mm-hmm. And you ha- you know you have your own personal bias. You you know you happen to be into I'm going to keep coming back to you. <laughs> you happen to be into MMA sure, yeah. and the author of this book comes in and you make a little connection you're like I'm going to put that book on a table. Mm-hmm. I like it. Yes. Maybe the customers of the store don't give a shit about MMA yeah, and yeah. you're not going to sell any. But, you know, you're, you you take a little chance and you put things that uh, that interest you on the on the tables, Definitely. on display. But if you only do that and your customers don't care about what you care about, you're going to go out of business. <laughs> Without a doubt. And it's just as simple as that. Yes. So what you got to do is know, like, my customers love, like, at Green Apple, I know that my customers love cookbooks i can buy like the weirder the better like the more esoteric professional you know 
narrow, you know, uh, international cuisine, we can sell it. That's awesome. And, and, um, and so I just know that I can take a big, I can take a big chance on different kinds of cookbooks. Mm -hmm. Whereas other topics, you know, I'm not going to, not going to buy the new Michael Savage book because my customers don't want that. Mm -hmm. it's, and, 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 you know, the, 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 the right wingers would, would accuse me of censorship, but it's not censorship. It's, Business. Capitalism. Yeah, it's business. It's capitalism. <laughs> it's, it's pure it's, business. Which is always my response. Like when somebody comes in and says, how come you don't carry Rush Limbaugh's books <laughs> or Sean Hannity? It's like, because I'm a capitalist yeah, and exactly. I want to make money. P I, I, and it, blow, it blows my mind how people just can't understand that simple concept. Like if you own, yeah. if you owned a bookstore in I, I'm like Arkansas, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to sell a lot of Rachel Maddow books. You no, know? <laughs> I, and, if, and if that's all I did, if I insisted on not carrying Sean Hannity and only carrying, you know, uh, anti-Trump books, uh -huh. fine, I can shut the doors after six <laughs> exactly, months. Exactly, yeah, but, yeah. But, um, but, you know, so, it, it's, so it's a combination of both those things. Yeah. You know, so it's the things you like, you want to champion, you're yeah. like, and, and which is really important because there's books that you know are good that your customers have never heard of. And, uh, and you put them out there and, and they trust you. Mm -hmm. you. You actually asked me earlier about the differences between different bookstores. Yes. And they're buying. And uh, Green Apple's a generalist store. We carry, we carry pretty much anything that people want to buy. Okay. You know, I remember when Sarah Palin's book, first book came out after, you know. She has her, more than one? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe it was only one. Maybe okay, you're right. okay, okay. But, but I, I remember I was the buyer at that point, and I thought, you know, people are going to want to buy this book. Yeah. Like, I think people are going to be interested. So yeah. uh, what we did is we put it on display, and we, we, uh, we put a little shelf talker on it that said 100% of the proceeds will be donated to uh, an organization that, uh, works to prevent aerial hunting of wolves, <laughs> and and it was great because the book was available. Uh -huh. You could buy it from us if you wanted, but you also understood that the you know that we were making a political point. Amazing. But we weren't not carrying it. We don't <laughs> not carry books based upon their content. Mm -hmm. I mean, and we're we're very adamant about that. You know, um, that goes for the right and the left. But um, like, well, like for instance, you sell a copy of Infinite Jest. You're gonna put another copy of Infinite Jest right back on the shelf, right? I mean, there's gonna be books that you're gonna always be selling no matter what. As long as they keep selling, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and there's sometimes books that don't sell that we carry, you know, because mm -hmm. we think we should have it. Mm -hmm. um, but I was gonna mention earlier, City Lights is a store that um, they do a lot more curating. Yes, they, I'm they actually, well aware. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, they would actually say they stand behind every book they sell. Yes. I think they would say that. We yeah. don't say that. Yeah. We sell a lot of crap. Mm -hmm. We sell a lot of books by people who are awful human beings. <laughs> um, we do not, I don't even know like what a lot of the authors of the books that we sell are up to in their private time. Most definitely. And I don't really care. That's on your business. Uh, unless they're, you know, advocating, you know, violence against of course. humans. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but City Lights, uh, they actually... I think they would actually say that they only sell books that they think are good. Mm -hmm. And so if something is bad, uh, <laughs> not to mention any specific examples, but you know, poorly written novel that's selling well, yeah. they might not carry it. Yeah. I think, I don't want to speak for them, but I think they might not. I think they'd say, no, that's just not our kind of book. I mean, I don't Even think you can't buy a Stephen King book there. I don't think you can't buy JK Rowling. There. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, but, but you know, but that's fine. And, you, and there's also, um, I don't know if you know, Folio Books down in Noe Valley. Um, they're same kind of thing. You know, it's a very curated, yep. um, exact because they have a certain clientele. So you say you yeah. can buy as many cookbooks as you want and sell them. You know, I'm sure they can buy you know as many you know X book and sell those because of the people who sure. live there. Um, right. Um, yeah. yeah, and you guys were great when, the, when, when you know. I don't want to harp on the pandemic, but when the whole pandemic kind of hit, you know, you guys were your website was super easy to use. I mean, I would get books from you guys in a day or two. Uh, well, thanks. Yeah, yeah no, that, it, it was huge. That was huge. that was a challenge, but thank you for that. Yeah, no, and, you're being too kind. Yeah, no, and I bought all the shirts. I did everything. Um, yeah. All right, Kevin, I feel like we could talk for hours. Um, let's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's let's end here. Fun. Maybe we'll get you back on the podcast. Um, do you want to? Is there anything kind of coming up in Green Apple's fu immediate future? Future or I guess events aren't really happening. Um, is there anything you want well, to kind doing, of? We're doing the Zoom. 
Oh, and, okay. And, you know, the the good thing about the Zoom events is uh, because nobody has to travel, we can actually do events with kind of you know bigger name authors. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't even know what we've got coming up, but uh, can people check? Is it on the website? It's all on the website. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and make sure you um Green Apple has a great, very active Instagram account. Um, whoever. I think, yeah, our social media. Mm-hmm. We kill it with the social yeah, media. No, you Instagram. Guys, and, you guys have been yeah. Great. All right, cool. Well, Kevin, dude, thanks so much for having, taking the time to talk to us. Um, I'm sure I'm going to think about a thousand other questions as soon as we get off. Um, but yeah, well, yeah, yeah. But good again, luck with so, Richard Powers. Oh, well, yeah. I will trust me. I will let you know what's going on with yeah. that for sure. Uh, all right, cool, everyone. This was Kevin, hey. the owner of Green Apple Books. Um, thanks for hanging in for another episode of Writing Friction, and uh, we'll see you all again next time. Thanks.